Is this an extremely weird niche thing to talk about? Yes. Am I going to talk about it anyway? Absolutely. Recently, I was just going about my life as usual, playing a YouTube video in the background as I do whatever else I have to do because I have ADD and my brain constantly needs something to gnaw on. So there I was, just brushing my teeth, when one of these videos made me stop short and realize I had suddenly found a new video subject for my own channel. Chatham, a short, animated web series from 2010, based on the character Chatham by the artist Alex Pardee. You might notice from the clips I am playing of the show itself that the animation looks... bad. And not just because the only version of it I could find online is the one that's just... up on YouTube. Well, no, that's a lie, I'm just not American enough for Amazon to accept my money. But what isn't the fault of 360p resolution is still just... bad. I'm sorry, there's nothing else to it, this looks less like an animated series and more like a video game out of the early 2000s. Because it essentially is. All of the 3D animation in this series was done in the Unreal Engine. Yes, really. So I'm sorry, but we are just going to have to deal with it. The only artistic bright spots in the series are when the animation shifts to 2D stills. There's a lot of history here surrounding the origins of the character, his rise to fame, and the utter bungling of this series. If that sounds at all interesting to you, I highly recommend the video that introduced me to Chatham in the first place. It's on the channel Nightmind, it's great and goes much deeper into the logistical failings of this series and why it's... like this. That brings me around to my own reasons for covering this series. The moment I heard Mr. Nocturne describe the villain, I knew I was going to find something worth talking about here. And oh boy did I. The story of Chatham is... cliché and poorly paced, and while the character designs that aren't repeated ad nauseum for background characters, and what little world-building we get are interesting, they unfortunately only serve to cover the core of yet another zombie movie with a visually interesting coat of paint. Also, our main character is yet another misunderstood artistic loner with previously unrealized phenomenal cosmic power. The main female character gets fridged, and her daughter almost does as well. All of this along with moments like this Yes, I really feel the urgency here while our hero is slowly ambling down the stairs. It just makes for an on the whole mediocre viewing experience. But what tips this over from disappointing end result of a project that could have created something truly unique? into actually uncomfortable-to-watch territory, is the villain. Viceroy, the reason for the recent zombie, I'm sorry, pallid, outbreak. He is a mad scientist, a serial killer, and a cannibal. So, really just a big mashup of several different horror villains? This, in and of itself, is naturally not the problem. No, the problem comes in when we get into his backstory and reasoning. The reason why Viceroy seeks knowledge so frantically, why he turned down this path in the first place, is that he, too, is pallid. But he's different, he's not like the things he's created. They are mindless monsters more akin to zombies than people. Viceroy was born this way. He was born different, and disgusted by him, his mother abandoned him on an orphanage's doorstep. Growing up, he never understood the children around him, and they didn't understand him. 
Society rejected him, the system failed him, and so he turned to science to attempt to figure out why. He studied books and dissected animals and corpses, and after years of work, he did find something. A gland, the same in every person, but with no set location. It was a start, but it was apparently not enough. So he kidnapped a living person and cut their gland out of them, which is when things really started going to shit. The gland, when removed from a living victim, glowed. In this world, it would seem that most people have them somewhere in their bodies. It's responsible for their creativity and imagination, and its location in their bodies is somehow related to their particular talent. And Viceroy was born without one. But that's not all. With his gland removed, the sculptor Viceroy kidnapped changed. He became pallid. So Viceroy, of course, does the only logical thing. Please note the sarcasm. He eats the gland. It gives him some kind of incredible high, and he promptly spirals down a road of harvesting as many glands as possible so he can keep consuming them in a variety of ways. The effects never last, but his body does begin to change. The allegory here is so obvious it's almost painful. <laughs> The money-hungry executives hunting down and stealing people's talent, draining the life out of genuine creative freedom in an attempt to make it their own. Except it really doesn't work here. Not least because Viceroy has no real societal power in this story. It might be different if he did, but as it stands, he was a disabled child, abandoned and failed by the system that should have safeguarded him, and he never rose out of that. His lab is in a broken-down old building, his equipment is homemade and clunky, and the furthest thing from sterile I've seen since Bloodborne. This is very much a back-alley operation. The parallels to the stifling of creatives by powerful executives falls flat on its face barely a second after the starting pistol, and what we're left with is a story where the main villain has a congenital disability, and that's what makes him evil. And before you try to say I'm reaching, this is literally text. Maybe not intentionally, but still. In this world, almost everyone is born with this creativity gland, it is one of the base things present in an able-bodied individual. Viceroy was born without one, therefore he is disabled. What's worse is, when you take into account his description of how he had trouble understanding and interacting with his peers, his experience also begins to mirror a lot of neurodivergent kids. Not in the lacking creativity bit, plenty of us are very creative, but in the general sense of simply not understanding the people around him, especially those in his own age group. So, yes, the villain is a disabled, ND-coded man who is evil strictly and only because of his disability. <laughs> like a reverse Disney's Hunchback of Notre Dame, Viceroy was abandoned for his congenital disability, and in his hunger to know why me, why am I different, he spiraled down a path of villainy. He is the disabled character who is so desperate not to be disabled anymore that they decide to commit crimes against humanity about it. He is the other who is greedy and envious of the things we have, and becomes a danger because of it. And the most bizarre thing in all of this is that Viceroy's backstory does not exist to draw any kind of sympathy or understanding to him. It is supposed to serve only as exposition. You're not supposed to sympathize with this monster. Certainly none of the characters do. 
He is not supposed to be one of those complex villains who you can understand where they're coming from and why they landed where they are, while still being rightfully disgusted with their actions. He is supposed to be the kind of Saturday morning cartoon villain who can cackle evilly in his secret underground science lair, and have you take it at face value. When, at the end of the series, Chadam swears that nothing like this will ever happen again, the promise comes off completely hollow because there's nothing in place establishing what, exactly, he's going to do to change things. If another pallid is born, are they just going to kill it? Is that the message? Do we have eugenics now? Or are we going to be accepting and accommodating of any pallids who may be born in the future? I somehow doubt it's the second option. Because despite being blatantly shown the mistreatment and discrimination Viceroy suffered throughout his entire life, there's no examination of the society that created him. His evil is treated as the logical and only outcome of his disability. He was born without a gland, so this senseless butchery to try and get his hands on even a shred of what life would be like with one is the natural progression for him. Not even Viceroy himself contests this. When directly asked why he did this, instead of citing something like revenge, or a desire to be normal, as questionable as both of those reasonings would be anyway, he just talks about his research. The story tells us that he is like this because it is his nature. Because all pallids hunger for the glands. Those who are artificially created have the added side effect of the zombie mind state to make them a flesh-hungry mob, and Viceroy, who by all rights should just be another person with a slightly different brain, is driven to a complete frenzy by his hunt for them. The only person who even slightly contests this is Simpkin, whose gland removal Viceroy botched, leaving him with this half-pallid look he's got going on. But the implication with him is very much that he still has enough of his gland left for it to be functional, so he's safe to be around. In the end, Viceroy gets to join the already massive number of disabled villains out there, and he doesn't even have the decency to be compelling about it. It shouldn't be possible with a backstory like his, but he is completely flat. What you see is what you get. No nuance, no further depth, just your run-of-the-mill mad scientist. Then again, most of the characters here are about as deep as a cardboard cutout, so at least he's got company. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to go lay down with a cup of tea and a fresh headache. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, consider liking it and maybe subscribing. I will be back here Thursday after next. Bye.